Hello, knitters and friends. Welcome to episode 12 of the Seedling Stitch Knitting Podcast. I'm your host, Athena, and I am coming to you from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, if you are new, welcome to my little corner where I share my journey into knitting. And also there will be some crocheting contents starting from episode because I'm starting to learn crochet from like two weeks ago. And I'm so excited to share my progress with you. So just a little bit introduction about me. I am a knitter and I am also teaching knitting classes at my local yarn store, Wet Coast Wools. And I'm also a novice knitwear designer where I've published a couple patterns on Ravelry. And apart from that, I am also a PhD student in mechanical engineering in my last few months. Uh, In fact, I've just had some good progress with my thesis writing, so I have some time to film an episode on this weekend. And in this episode, I will announce my animal friend Knit Along, and I have some work in progress to share, especially about my fortune sweater, and as well as some of my progresses with my crocheting. And I also have some acquisitions and make plans. So without further ado, please grab your knitting or your snacks or drinks, and let's get started on this episode. So first, I am going to announce my animal friend, Knit Along. In my previous episodes, I have talked about the making of Charlotte the Fox from the book Knitted Animal Friends, and also the rabbit Tilly and a sloth adapted from an owl, also from the book. And a lot of you expressed your interest in also making an animal friends motivated by all your enthusiasm about animal friend knitting i decided to run this animal friend knit along uh, starting from now and i'm going to run it until the uh, until christmas at the end of this year and uh, i'm just going to make christmas uh, as a tentative deadline for this knit along just so that i can encourage you to make an animal friend and if this knit along runs well i'm going to reboot it later on so that we can keep knitting animal friends about some rules of this knit along you can participate this knit along with all sorts of animals species sizes or uh styles or by designers so you don't have to select a pattern from this book you can also select other uh, animal knitting patterns from revelry i have recommended some knitted animal patterns in my episode 10 and you are also free to choose your own patterns or you could also buy those kits uh, that provides pattern within the kit and also the yarn uh, as long as it's knitting. So I would restrict the project to be a knitting project. So a uh, pr- crochet like a migulumi type of projects uh, are not preferred just so that we can focus on the knitting techniques that are required by uh, making a soft animal. And to participate in this knit along, I ha- uh, you can either join in the Ravelry group or Instagram. I have started a Ravelry group called Animal Friend K A L, and I'll put a link in below as well. And we've I've already started some uh, discussions in this group, and you can share your photos of your work in progress or your finished objects. You can join this knit a lot anytime. Uh, like if you have already started knitting an animal, or if you are going to knit an animal in two months or so, that will be fine. It's you can join at any time. When you make a project page in your Ravelry, you can also choose like on the right hand side there is a share with group in the tab and you can select share with the animal friend call group so it will appear in the projects tab in the animal friend call group and other group members will be able to see your projects 
So if you use Instagram as well, you can also share your uh, photos or videos with the hashtag uh, AnimalFriendCow. I'll print it out here. And if you run into any uh, challenges or difficulties in making these animals, you can also ask questions in the forum and I will check the forum regularly to answer any questions or uh, I believe other kind-hearted knitters will help you as well. I, and for me, I am going to participate in October because I am swamped by some other projects for now and I am going to knit the uh, Lulu Rabbit, I think, by uh, Popova, I think, by Popova. And uh, it's a small, cute animal rabbit and I think I have the yarn for it and I'll post photos by then. And there are already several members who have already posted their uh, work in progress or finished objects, finished animals photos within the group. And uh, I welcome you to join the group and take a look at their progresses and see if you want to make your own animal. And by the way, I have also uh, made a bundle within the group uh, of recommended patterns and recommended uh, anim native animal designers. You can take a look at their patterns to see if uh, uh, there, there is an animal pattern that you're interested in knitting. And about the price, I'm still thinking and as some of the returning viewers know that I am a big fan of Japanese knitting books and I have found a Japanese knitting book that is all about the doll clothing. Um, I'll, I'll put a picture here. I have ordered uh, the Chinese translation of this book because it's easier for me to order one. Uh, and in this book, there, there are like 16 or 20 different animal doll uh, sweater patterns from different uh, region or different cultures and those like and those sweaters are designed by famous designers from each of these uh, countries like I think there's one uh, there's probably one uh, Norwegian sweater designed by uh, Anne and Carlos and there are also like the Latovian type of sweaters and there's the Aaron sweaters and the Fire Isle sweaters so that like you can practice the different knitting techniques from different countries just by knitting a small sweater for a doll and maybe even for your animal friend doll so that will be I think nice and unfortunately it doesn't have an English version but uh, as I have said in my previous episodes for the Japanese knitting books, it's very graphical. So you can basically just read their schematics and diagrams uh, to understand how to knit this sweater. And I've also made some videos to teach you how to read Japanese knitting schematics and patterns. Uh, let me know in the comments if you would be interested in having this book as the price of this knit along or if you have other suggestions for a price like if you aren't interested in the book I'll just keep the book for myself. I think the rule will be you uh, finish your knitted animal by Christmas this year and make a post in the finished object thread in the group discussion on Ravelry. Uh, so each finished animal friend will count as one entry so like if you finished more uh, animal friends you can make multiple posts on the thread and it will make your chance of getting the price higher so I think that will be a good motivation for you to uh, join the call and that's the announcement on um, the first regarding what I'm wearing uh, if you're a returning viewer you've seen this many times that's my June top light designed by Petit Knit but with a lot of modifications by me and there's only one more thing I want to show you from last time. I added uh, this crocheted double chain to the back and I, uh, I sewed it between the two uh, shoulder straps because I find that this shoulder strap is kind of long 
and it's it sometimes it will like fall off like this and um I just want to give it a bit more uh, stability on the shoulder strap so I made this and also uh, I'm learning crocheting so I wanted to try a crochet cord instead of like a knitted eye cord thing like this for this top there's a lot of eye cord bind off on all these edges and if knitting is your thing you can knit like a three stitch eye cord to do this thing but I wanted to try a crochet eye cord and it's much faster than the knitting this double chain cord is made with uh, like a crochet chain but you have a long tail and each time when you are crocheting the chain uh, you wrap the crochet hook with the long tail once before you crochet the, uh, before you make a crochet chain with the working yarn. Uh, it's quite neat and I might make a short video on this technique later. So like if you need to make eye cord, you can substitute that with this double chain with crochet. And this cord is a little bit narrower than a three uh, than a three stitch eye cord, but they look very similar. And especially for my use case, I don't need this cord to be super strong. I just need it to give it a little bit stability, a little bit of tension between these uh, shoulder straps. So I don't need the, uh, the cord to be strong, but I want it to look good. So I think this double chain is a good choice. And now this shoulder strap won't come off easily. And I can wear this June top light with more confidence. And that's all about this. And we're going to move on to my crochet contents. So I, I've probably said before, I tried to learn crochet a while ago, uh, but I, I didn't carry on. And the, the issue back then was that I used some of those uh, thick wool, uh, rustic yarn to practice and the friction is very strong so the yarn is not smooth and it's very hard to move around the crochet hook and also the issue is that uh, I use the dark color of the yarn so it's very hard to see the stitches so if you are learning some new fiber arts either knitting or crocheting um, you should try to use a smoother or uh, at least light colored yarn. So two weeks ago, I decided to give crochet a try again because I was back then I was doing some uh, like stuck in that knitting and I was a bit bored and I I just like have that very adventurous mood. So I decided to try crochet again. So uh, the way I learned crochet is from a book. Uh, this is also a Japan. So this is a Chinese translation of a Japanese crocheting textbook. Uh, oh, and by the way, I found a seller on Etsy that sells Japanese knitting and crafting books. I think they offer almost all the Japanese books that I've talked about in the podcast. So I'll I'll put the link in below if you're interested in getting some of those Japanese uh, crafting books, you can take a look at that at the shop. And uh, if you read Chinese, I highly recommend this book. You just take a screenshot and try to find this book. And I'll link the Japanese version of this book below as well, uh, if you are just interested in getting the graphs. And the good thing about this book is that so it teaches you like all the all the basic methods for like doing a chain and it has the photos as well as uh, the little like uh, cartoons and just for me I prefer to learn from a book than like learning from videos because uh, like if you're watching if you're watching a video you have to uh, you always have to like stop and try to work the same thing and then if you forget how to do something you will have to go forward or go back with the 
time bar and it's not very convenient for me and sometimes the perspective of the video aren't it is not so good and it's kind of hard to see where exactly did they put the hook in that sort of thing but in the book you can control the pace of your learning as well as it's like using the symbols and the text description to show you how to do those steps exactly and also I like a more systematic way of learning so I want to know like how many stitches I, different stitches I need to learn so like I need to learn the chain and then I need to learn the single crochet uh, double crochet half double crochet and that's the basic and then and like for this book the first chapter is just to learn those basic stitches and then it will give you a project to do and this is like just a simple mat thing with the, the basic stitches and there's also like a more complicated one and then the next chapter the chapter two it teaches you how to do like how to knit in the round and by the end of this chapter, it teaches you how to knit those beautiful like granny square or hexagon or circles. Uh, after that, it will teach you the more complicated like increase and decrease stitches, the cluster stitches and the popcorn stitches. And after that, you will be able to like make more complicated projects like these lacy mats and this beautiful color and then it also teaches you how to do like color work and how to make a granny square blanket by linking those granny, granny squares so it teaches you all these relevant techniques until uh, finally uh, you will be ready to make a crochet garment like these and at the beginning it, it gives you a symbol chart for what all these crocheting symbol means so just two weeks ago i started to work the chapter two like uh, crochet in the round of this book again and the first thing i did was just this little circle made with single crochet stitches and then I make a bigger circle with this uh, double crochet stitches and, uh, and my husband connected these two uh, like circles with uh, an elastic band and put it on the hand of the sloth uh, to like so that it works like a handkerchief from my hometown, which is the northeastern area of China, there is like a regional, a comedy opera kind of thing called Arendran. And uh, in this opera comedy kind of thing, uh, it's very common to, uh, to use these sort of handkerchief as a tool for performance. Like the actors on the stage, they will like roll these handkerchiefs or like roll these handkerchiefs like rotate these handkerchiefs like that and it requires some skills and it's just kind of fun and then we decided to <laughs> put this uh, handkerchief on a slot it's kind of cute after that point i learned to crochet in the circles and then i decided to do a granny square and this is my first granny square and I just followed a pattern from the book uh, it is a very basic granny square made with only double crochet stitches and uh, some crochet chain and this time I used the uh, sheepies katona yarn which is a, a, a which is just a cotton fingering weight yarn that I got for like my animal clothing and this yarn is uh, so much easier to work with if you want to start learning crochet I would recommend some like smooth 100% uh, cotton yarn to start with and 
Also, I would recommend you start with some like granny square. And another motivation for me to learn crochet is uh, because of the uh, Wooly Witchcraft Knitting Podcast by Brogan. And in her uh, latest podcast, uh, I, I will link the, the podcast below. Uh, I, I really love her podcast, highly recommend, but probably you've already seen her. And, and she is a longtime crocheter and she started learning to knit like one year ago-ish. And in her recent episode, uh, she was showing some crochet projects. She showed like a crocheted basket and she said she finished making the whole basket uh, in the morning and it's like a big basket and and it looks pretty good and she also showed her idea of making a sunflower cardigan I think and she was just crocheting some sunflower uh, granny squares and she had some plans on how to connect them together and made them into a uh, into a cardigan and it, it it's really pretty and I and I immediately want to try to make a sunflower uh, granny square myself as well so uh, I so I read into chapter three and four into this book to learn the increase decrease and the cluster stitches and I thought I'm ready to do a granny square and then I made one hey <laughs> So this one is made with double crochet stitches and some cluster stitches for the orange and yellow and then on the outer uh, green layer they are made with half double crochet, uh, double crochet and triple crochet. So there you have it. Um, for this one I, I I don't have the yellow yarn in the katona and I just had some scrip uh, yellow yarn from my uh, sock yarn and just enough to make this one granny square and I'm thinking to give these uh, squares as gift for my uh, supervisors in for my PhD I have three supervisors so I have yet another granny different granny square to make but like now that I really like this sunflower uh, granny square pattern, I want to make more. A couple months ago, I saw a pattern posted by Sandy Scar on her Instagram and it was a, a crocheted bag made with a granny square that looks similar to this but it, they they only use the white color and and now I think I might be able to make that bag and I just kind of got obsessed with granny square bags so I, I don't want to buy new yarn just for making this bag so I dig into my pile of my grandma's gift yarn and found some uh, color that could make a sunflower granny square and here they are. I have made two and a half of these. And these are like a true granny square made with 100% grandma's yarn. I'm actually wondering why granny square are called granny square. Maybe that's because like grannies, they tend to have yarn, uh, like a, a rich yarn stash with different colors and they like to make them into uh, crochet squares to have different colors and and I think I perhaps just did the same thing with my grandma's yarn because uh, I'm combining all these beautiful colors of like scrape yarn that she had to make these things. I'll show you the yarn. Uh, so in the middle that is the brown colored yarn. I have actually used this yarn to make uh, the silly, the, the sail sweater by Petit Knit, which I've already sent to my mom. And I have like this much left and, I'm, and it's like a light fingering weight yarn. So I'm holding four strands together and I am using 4.5 millimeter crochet hooks. The orange yarn is this one. 
I had one big ball. Uh, previously, I was planning to use it to make a, like a fox scarf, but I haven't had the time to do that. So it's like a, I think a, a acrylic yarn, it feels like. So I'm just holding one strand of this yarn. It, it seems like it's in worsted or iron weight. So that's for, that's for the second layer. And then the third layer is the yellow. Uh, I don't have those bright yellow colored yarn. The closest yellow color yarn I could find was this one, a fingering weight. It feels like a woolly yarn from my grandma. And, and she had a lot of this yarn. Um, I, I didn't particularly like this color, but it seems nice to fit into these granny squares. So I think I found a good place to use it. So I'm holding three strands of this uh, like fingering weight yarn together uh, for the third layer of the petals of the sunflower. And then the, like the background, the fourth layer, I use this pine green-ish yarn. I only have one ball of this so I don't know if that will be enough for making the buttercup bag by Sanescar um, because in the butter buttercup bag I will also need to crochet an edge of the bag with the same color as the background as well as the strap so I it's probably not going to be enough, but I'll probably find some other yarn from my grandma's stash um, to make the bag. So now I'm just crocheting these squares and then I will link them together when I accumulated enough square. And I really enjoy making these granny squares because like when you're doing granny square, you are, you are only poking your crochet hooks in, in these big holes instead of like into the stitches. So it's easier to do. And for changing off color in a, in a new round, I will just like leave the end like this. And when I'm uh, crocheting the new color, I will just weave in the end as I go. Uh, at the moment, I'm enjoying learning crochet a lot and I can see myself doing a lot of crochet as well as a lot of knitting. And I've already had a lot of plans for future crochet projects. I think crochet is really good for making bags and like has like those things with a stiff fabric. Uh, I, I don't think I enjoy crochet for making garments. I would prefer knitting for like making a sweater or something. And uh, I have uh, and since I started learning crochet, I have been looking at yarns that are good for crocheting and then I found the raffia type of yarn, which is like a grass or like paper-ish plant-based yarn, a stiff, uh, a plant-based stiff yarn that are good for making straw hats or bags. And though I've seen some tutorials for those raffia hats or raffia bags, and I kind of got obsessed with it. So I ordered some raffia yarn from China that I wanted to try. And I also found a book for making raffia bags, a Japanese knitting book. And I have made that order. And the best thing about this book is that you can customize your own bag. You can select which uh, bottom pan which which shape of the bottom panel you want and you can select a pattern for the body of the bag and then you can select what kind of strap you want for the bag and uh, and then combine them together to have your own bag. So like there are uh, infinite number of possibilities that you can get from the book so uh, it's it's just uh, like being customizable is something that I really like so I've ordered the book and I'm hoping my raffia yarn to re to arrive soon but I know they will arrive in probably in October <laughs> like in autumn or winter and then I will be making uh, bags for next summer and it will be it will be fun and I, I, 
I will, I will show you my progress by then. And just a question for you. Uh, I, I think in the future, I will also have some crocheting contents. Uh, if you are more interested in the knitting contents, uh, let me know and then I can like put all my crochet in uh, the last section so that you can jump through that or uh, tell me what you think about the crochet contents of my channel and and I also have a question for crocheters among you as an experienced crocheter do you also use those graphic Patterns, or you are more comfortable with those written instructions or you use both and if you don't use the pattern with the symbols but would like to learn about it also let me know maybe I could make uh, like a Japanese crochet mini class in the future just to explain how to read those charts in the future and being a beginner crocheter myself i'm all i'm starting to plan my beginner crochet class at the yarn store so that's a bit crazy but i think it won't be long before i can start this crochet class uh, because i've been pr practicing crocheting very hard and i think i'm making some fast progresses so yay for that. And other finished objects for me, there's just the boring one. I made another, my no frills toe up socks. And this is for my French intern who have been helping me in the lab for the whole summer. So she deserved to have a gift and she's the lover of beautiful socks. So she will have this. And the, and the new acquisition is this sock blocker that I just got yesterday at the yarn shop. So I basically finished teaching a sock knitting class and then I used what I earned for buying more stuff for sock, for sock knitting. So uh, it, it's good. <laughs> it's like uh, financial sustainability for myself, for my knitting career. It's, uh, and and now I can be like a professional knitting YouTuber with these sock blockers. And well, at the yarn shop, I also rewarded myself with a sock yarn. And this is a new arrival at the yarn shop. It's a series of self-patterning sock yarn with fruit themes. And this one I bought is a kiwi fruit. And this will be what it will look like after you knit them up. And they also have like watermelon and dragon fruit, papaya fruit, and passion fruit, and banana. They are all so cute. And I decided to only buy one <laughs> so, that, so as not to spoil myself. And this is the brand. Uh, it is Flot Sock. Uh, fresh fruit I think it's like the it's the German for fresh fruit it's a uh, it's a cotton 90% cotton and 10% polyester yarn and 100 gram of uh, 100 gram in each ball which consists of 360 meters and I'm thinking what to do with this I definitely would knit my no frills toe up socks pattern um, because I, I love the fit of my own pattern on my feet. I usually use 50 gram of socks yarn for one pair of socks for myself. And if I use contrasting color for the heel and the toe, I will use like 40 gram of the main color and 10 gram of the, of the contrasting color. And I'm just debating whether to use a uh, contrasting color for the toe and heel for me. So I, I don't like to knit like two pairs of same, same socks for myself. So I'm thinking maybe I could make one pair for my husband. And then I'll probably use like 40 gram of this as my own main color and then 60 gram of this for his main color and then I will need to buy another ball of yarn for the contrasting heels and the color, the contrasting color, I think I will like get one of this brown 
sock yarn, like the, like the peel color of the kiwi fruit, because I think that makes sense. Yeah, and I'll just get some yarn and get get some knitting on this fun self striking yarn. I love this. And now let's move on to my work in progresses. There's only one work in progress for the week. And I've been working very hard on my fortune sweater. And in my last episode, I was just barely casting this on. And this is a sample knitting for uh, Knit City. Uh, Knit City is a yarn festival happening in Vancouver at September 24th and 25th on the weekend. And the yarn shop where I work, Wet Coast Wools, is going to participate in this uh, in this festival and one of the yarn that they carry is this Kama Rose um, Midnight Soul which is a baby alpaca, tenso and merino yarn from I think from Denmark and this green color I use is uh, 9512 which is I think sea green or something and it looks, and for me, I think it looks it looks like matcha ice cream, because there's a little like thread of white, perhaps from the tensile in the yarn, and then it features it also features this beautiful green. I think it it it, it probably looks greener than it appears in the video, because of the lighting in my room is not ideal but it's really a very gentle shade of green and I love it. Uh, so I finished the yoke. Uh, this sweater is a top-down construction with a folded collar and a raglan uh, and raglan sleeves. I just separated the sleeves like two days ago on the Friday night and I've only knitted a couple rounds after, since that. And there are a few new techniques that I've learned with knitting this pattern. Um, the first thing is this folded collar and the second, the second thing is uh, using German short rows to raise the back. As you can see, the back is taller than the front, so which means there will be a little bit more fabric on the back, about this much, which were done uh, knitted in the flat with German short row techniques while you're knitting, and only after that you will knit in the round. Uh, and this technique is used in some other top-down constructions as well and it might worth some explanation so I will do just that. So let's take a look at what if you don't do the German short roll. I'll show you my first regular sweater. is this sweater, little sweater for uh, my sloth. Like I'll just explain how top-down regular construction works. So uh, it, the, so if you don't do the German short row and just do a regular raglan, it means that you will start by casting on something in the round. And there will be four raglan lines. And let's say that this star is the beginning of your round and you will be like knitting in this direction. And these four lines will separate the different sections of your clothing. So let's say between these two red lines, it will be the front of your garment. And then this will be your right sleeves. And then this will be, and this will be your back and this will be your left sleeves and when you are doing raglan you will do some increases along this raglan line so i'm just using the japanese symbol for doing raglans so 
So the regline stitch is just one stitch that you knit regularly. And um, wh whenever you meet a regline stitch, you will uh, increase one increase one stitch along uh, on the right side of the stitch and you will increase another stitch on the left side of it uh, just so that as you so just so that on every round you will add eight stitches and in, in these euro raglan constructions you will do one round with increasing eight stitches and then another round without increasing any stitches just so that every two rows you will be increasing eight stitches in total and as you do this uh, again and again the circle that you knit will be bigger and bigger so as eventually you will end up uh, with something like this so that's sort of what I did for the regular, this regular sweater for the slot and you can see the regular line along this sleeves, this sleeves, and between the back and sleeve, and between the back and that sleeve. And the if you do the raglan this way, and you will have symmetrical piece of garment in the front and in the back, and uh, and it will and that will be okay if it's just a doll clothing. And if it's for human, you will see that this color will just be very close to your neck. Usually we would a bit want a bit more space uh, at the front of the neck and we probably want the color to be like very close to our neck at the back and and to achieve that in the garment you will have to add a little bit more fabric on the back just so that you will have a bit more fabric in the back and a little bit less fabric in the front and basically you would want to ma move your uh, neck hole to some place like that and to achieve that you have to do a ger to do some German short row before you knit in the round for the regular increases so we we still have this regular lines and we cast on uh, something in the round for the neck hole and we still have our start of the round between the front and the uh, left. Uh, but instead of knitting in the round, you will be knitting in the flat. And on the first row, you are going to like knit to somewhere here. Like you knit like a couple stitches uh, over the regular line between the right sleeve and the front. And meanwhile, you will also be doing uh, the increases along the regular lines every two rows. And, and here you will turn with the German short row. So I'm going to mark this as my row one. And uh, turning with German short row is just a technique that uh, when you turn, you won't end up with a hole. So it's just like an extra step when you are turning. And on your second row, you're turning. You're going to knit like a couple stitches beyond uh, your first row. So I'm marking that as my row two. And then on your row three, you're turning again with German short row technique on your row three. You're just going to knit a couple stitch more than like where you prob where you previously finished. So that will be your row three. And then you go from here. and you knit a couple stitches more than where you previously turned in the last row and that will be your row four. So you just you just keep doing this back and forth for a couple more times until at a certain places you will stop uh, but you will stop before these two uh, these two turning stitches meet. 
So that depends on the design. And as you do this, you can see there will be more rows on the back and there will be no rows, no extra rows in the center part of the garment. And this way, as some designers say, you will be raising your back. So this is how much your back is raised. And we can look at the garment. So for this petite knit design, the back is raised by this much, and that is all done by the German short rule. And you can also see this part is where I have been turning. So you can see above here, the stitch is like pointing in this direction, but below here, the stitch is more like vertical, and that is achieved by the German short rows. So basically I was like knitting from here around to here and then like I turn here and then knit around and then a couple stitches beyond and then I turn and then I knit until probably like my two uh, German short row turning stitches are around here because like in the middle there's no like sign of turning and the turnings are all done along like on this section probably and and now the and now there are more space in the front of the neck hole and there are less space in the back of the neck hole and you can see i have already aligned uh, where i'm knitting here and after the German short row, you will just be knitting in the round with the raglan increases as I have introduced before uh, until you have reached this uh, this point uh, where you are where where it's like uh, roughly below your armhole, and at that point you will put some the extra stitches on the waist yarn or a cord or some extra circular needle uh, so you will have these stitches on the sleeves on the rest and then uh, I would and then I would just be knitting in the round for the body until the desired length so that will just be like plain sailing and then I will just knit the sleeves by uh, taking out the waist yarn and put them on my circular needle. Uh, apart from that, what else? There is like a clover eyelet pattern in a uh, loosely placed in the garment. I think that's why this uh, sweater is called the fortune sweater because of the four leaf clovers. And there's just another tip that if you are knitting with these uh, like silk mohair or brushed alpaca yarn, you probably don't want to center pull the, the balls because I did that for the first two balls and by the end of the knitting process, all these yarns are like, they are like at the outside and they are very loose and, and then they it entangled with each other and uh, it was very hard to organize them uh, again. And that's all the knitting I have to show you this time. Uh, one of you requests me to make some explanations on casting on methods. She said that she's been uh, seeing some knitters raving about provisional cast on or a tubular cast on or some other casting on methods. And she tried to learn them, but uh, didn't quite understand how they work and what's the benefits of doing them. And she would just like me to give a review on the casting on method with my engineering mind and well thank you for asking me the question and I'm just going to give you a short review uh, on my take on the casting on methods and uh, and just to say there's some reference that I got from this book Let's Knit in English by Tomoko Nishimura and in this book there is just one chapter that reviews a, a lot of casting on methods that are popular in Japan as well as popular in uh, the Western knitting world. And it's also based on some of my own knowledge on uh, casting on methods. So uh, I'm going to categorize casting on methods uh, uh, by 
the purpose or the use of the method. So from, from the basic casting on methods, if you just want to knit a swatch or uh, like if you don't have any special purpose for the cast for the cast on, then what you do is probably just the long tail cast on, or uh, or some or some other casting on methods that you are familiar with. The long tail cast on is my first casting on method, and it works probably on most of the occasions. And if and if your use case is not of any of the cases that I am going to talk about, then you will just use long tail cast on. There, there's no uh, problem with that. And going beyond that, uh, let's talk about provisional cast on. Provisional cast on is not any spe specific casting on methods. It's actually like a family of casting on methods. By provisional, it means that you will not be keeping the casting on edge. It's like you will unpick or uh, do something with that casting on edge so that you can like maybe knit in another direction, which is like a common use for provisional cast on. And any casting on methods that can achieve that goal, it will be called provisional cast on. And one of the most popular provisional cast on methods is the crocheted chain cast on where you crochet a chain and then you pick up stitches from the like the pearl bump from the crochet chain and you knit uh, above and afterwards you will uh, you will take out your crochet chain and pick up the stitches uh, along that line and then you will perhaps knit along the other direction. I've used this a couple times for my Provence top. I was playing a game of yarn chicken so uh, I basically crocheted, uh, so I basically did the provisional custom at the middle and then knit towards the top and then I knit down uh, and after I finished the yoke I knit uh, downwards uh, so that I can decide how long my garment is going to be. And in this drawn top light um, designed by Bedinit, she also provided an alternative provisional cast down method uh, where instead of the crochet chain, you could do a Judy's magic cast down and then just leave an extra needle there and so that you can knit in the opposite direction after you finish the top and decide how long your garment is. Uh, I've done the provisional cast on, on, on another case, which is on my beloved cat sweater. And just according to the design, you will do the provisional cast on at this edge and do the intarsia knitting above. And then uh, you will unpick the provisional cast on edge and then do this a uh, beautiful a uh, cable hem. I think the pattern asks you to do that way might be it might be because like some orientation of these cable it must be knitted top down instead of bottom up, uh, I guess. And there's also one provisional cast on method introduced by this book called invisible cast on, where you sort of just wrap. A, an extra yarn. I'll just show you the finished result. So you sort of just wrap a, like a waist yarn tail into your cast on edge and later when you just pull out this extra wa waist yarn and then you can knit to, into the other direction. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's like a video for this. There, there probably there must be, and this is called the invisible custom. And I think I would like to try this f for the next time if I need to do a provisional custom. Yeah, so if you need to knit into the opposite directions, then you will do, you will choose one of the provisional custom methods. Okay, another use case is on the rib edge. Like when you need to do some ribbing, and like in my socks, you would want it to be stretchy. And if you do the regular long tail cast on, your cast on won't be stretchy unless you like use 
needle two sizes or three sizes above uh, so that it could be stretchy. Uh, there are several casting on methods that allows you to have a stretchy cast on and one of the most popular one is the uh, Italian cast on also known as the tubular cast on also probably known as the stretchy cast on in this uh, last knitting English book and I can show you what it looks like and it will maintain the shape of the rib like this and just for contrast this is my new gata scarf and this one I just use the regular long tail cast on and the edge looks like this whereas the tubular cast on it looks like this and it's very stretchy and there are other ways that you can make your cast on stretchy one of them is the german twisted cast on it's kind of similar to long tail cast on but you wrap the yarn some extra times so that there's a little bit more yarn between your cast on edges but uh, the german twisted cast on looks similar to uh, the long tail cast on so it will have like this edge instead of uh, a shape of the rib if you are knitting some ribbings and you want it to be stretchy you can select one of the methods that allows for a stretchy cast on and depending on how you want the casting on edge to look like whether it's more harmonious or it's more visible then you can select the italian cast on or the german twisted cast on and i believe there are other casting on methods that can give you a stretchy edge as well but these are the two uh, methods that i know and there are other cast ons that allows for different shapes like there's the i cord cast on uh, if you if you want to cast on with an i cord already there there's the method of i cord cast on and there's the pico edge cast on where you cast on with already with an pico edge and I just learned last week from Margot at the yarn shop that there is a casting on method called uh, Chanel County cast on. You can go search for that. Uh, it also gives you a similar thing as a pico edge, but it's a, a smaller pico. It's more like a, a bean sized, like a smaller sized pico uh, cast on, which is also kind of fun. And there's another uh, family of cast on where I would say it works as an increase as well. So it will increase a line from uh, an already knitted piece. I'll explain what it means. For example, let, let's look at this little shoe of my rabbit. Here I need to have a shoe lace. And for that, I could use the, the these casting on methods to cast on or increase some stitches so that I can uh, I can have some extra stitches and knit this into the shoe lace. And to do that, there are two common methods. One is called the backward loop cast on and another is the knitted cast on. They both allow you to just have a, have some new edge on some old edge. It, th this is also what I do below the armhole. So here, after I separated the sleeves, I used the backward loop cast on to cast on like a few stitches here, just below the armhole. And this is very common for knitted, uh, for top down knitted sweaters. Like they usually ask you to use the backward loop cast on to cast on a few stitches. Uh, just so that you will have a better fit for your arm armhole. Yeah, and that's my take on the casting on methods. What's your favorite casting on methods? And is there any other casting on methods that you would like to recommend to the uh, to other knitters? Leave a comment in below. Uh, and for next episode, I have a very special guest. Uh, I have a friend from high school and she and she is an all-around maker she does like knitting crochet uh embroidery 
and uh, a little bit of sewing and she's um, and she's visiting Vancouver in like two weeks, three weeks and we're going to film an episode where I show all of her uh, fiber art projects and I'm very excited about that and that will be all the contents for this episode Thank you for watching and taking the time to knit with me. If you enjoyed the episode, please like, comment, subscribe, put a thumbs up. Uh, this will help me to reach more knitters. And I'm really enjoying building this uh, welcoming uh, knitting community uh, with all of you. If some of the tips and tricks that I talked in this episode were helpful for you, Please consider a uh, donate on my Ko-fi page, ko-fi.com slash stitch. You can buy me a coffee or become a monthly supporter so that I can have more time to produce more contents more regularly. Uh, all the projects and my design patterns are available on Ravelry. I'm on Ravelry as Athena Liu and on Instagram as SD underline Athena. And I'm happy to chat about knitting or crocheting or fiber arts with you or PhD <laughs> no, not PhD, not PhD uh, and as a tradition of my podcast I play a piece of piano at the end of each episode and today I'm going to play a little piece from one of my favorite uh, video games Animal Crossing and in that video game there is like a superstar called KK and he, he he is a dog and he produces a lot of albums and you can like buy his albums in the game one of them is like a classical piano piece and I'm go going to play that it's called the KK Etude and hope you enjoy that and until then see you next time happy knitting bye <laughs>